The Tripura Rahasya is a tantric text, as most of you know. A very unique text because it is in the form of stories, very often told by women. And in these stories, the characters of women are often teachers and we have a princess who is a teacher we have even the goddess Tripura Sundari who is invoked and appears we have a female ascetic or sannyasin and so a very unique text a shakta text and um, the teacher of teachers, Dattatreya, is the main character or teacher in this text. Dattatreya is also known as Guru of Gurus or teacher of teachers. And there are some interesting stories about him. And one of them is that he had 24 teachers. And these teachers are not necessarily teachers like we know as in persons but for example he talks about a python a python being his teacher because a python eats only as much as it can take and then it just rests and digests <laughs> and so very unique story about the teachers of Tattatreya so Currently, we are talking about the interaction between King Janaka and Ashtavakra. Ashtavakra gets his name from Ashta and Vakra. Ashta means eight and Vakra means crooked. And what is unique about this is that Ashtavakra has not got a straight spine. He has got eight knots or you'd say at eight points along his spine is is crooked and to most people such a character or person would not be able to really meditate or attain a higher states of consciousness which makes him all the more unique and king janaka of course being a, a great king and the sage king is featured in different stories and again what is different about this story is that King Janaka is teaching and the Brahman in this case Ashtavakra is the student. In most stories, especially the Ashtavakra Gita, it is Ashtavakra who is the teacher and the King Janaka is a student. So this is a very unusual text. It tends to reverse roles. So the woman teacher, as in the princess, teaching her husband, the prince, and then the king teaching the Brahmin, Brahmins being generally uh, regarded as uh, teachers or pundits or uh, learned people, um, are in this case, of course, is a student. So it tends to reverse roles, which makes this a very unique text. The last time we stopped at the three categories of seekers. And just to briefly recap, we said there are three categories. And the very first one was the category in which King Janaka himself came in. In this category, the, the finest example of teacher or student who attains within moments. He hears something and is a spontaneous experience of samadhi which is then established, remains established and stable. And that is, of course, the best student or seeker. 
The second category is given here as a student who attains knowledge systematically listening to the great adepts. So these are the, I would say, the category of students where work is required. They may have come to a point in this lifetime where they are open and they are willing to listen to great adepts, teachers, and have the trust and the faith, and they integrate this in their life. And the third category is of those seekers that do not attain the fruit of their sadhana or their practice in this lifetime. It requires many lifetimes. That's the third category. So we continue from verse 108. We stopped at this very auspicious number. And we continue from there. I'm reading. Why attain nir nirvikalp samadhi without having its wisdom? Even if a seeker experience it hundreds of times, it will not liberate him. Therefore, momentary samadhi attained during the waking state is in vain. Absolute knowledge is pure in its nature. And this is our essential nature. Knowing this fact... Under the influence of thoughts and desires, one does not realize it. If all thoughts, imagination and emotions are completely shunned, that which is self-illuminated would be ever green, ever young, ever free. That knowledge which is experienced during Nirvikalp Samadhi is pure knowledge. It is ever-present, unalloyed and free from blemish. How can it be experienced? So in these few paragraphs, the verses, we understand that Nirvikalp Samadhi cannot liberate you if it is momentary. You can experience it hundreds of times, but it will not liberate you. And we discussed that also in our earlier sessions, that it's fleeting in nature. It does help, however, if those fleeting samadhis, these momentary samadhis, have enough of an impact on you that you remember. If you remember, if you do not forget that moment and you long for it, that longing will lead you. And it is this longing that will eventually liberate you. So to those students who ask, how can I strengthen my practice? We always say, strengthen the longing. When the longing is strengthened, when you begin to feel, I must have that experience, that taste of that samadhi was so wonderful. It was such a joyous experience. I must go back there to that space, to that, those moments and live them very intensely and rest in those moments. And as that longing increases, it will pull you. It becomes a bit like, like a magnet attracts objects within its field or a planet, a heavy planet pulls other objects towards it. So also, it becomes like a pull which is irresistible. So when you have this longing, that really does make a big difference. So focus on strengthening this longing. When that happens, we know our essential nature. We forget our essential nature when under the influence of thoughts, desires, emotions, fears. These are like a dust on a mirror. They make it all cloudy. You cannot see your real nature anymore. But when 
This mirror is clear of thoughts, desires, emotions. You see your true self. You experience it. You're established in it. And that is like being ever young, ever green, ever free. Why ever green? What is ever green? Any ideas? Why the word ever green? Yes. Hi, Radhika Ji. Nilufa here. Yeah, hello, Nilufa. Hi, uh, Radhika Ji. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you know what? I'm actually on the uh, Tripura Rasya and Chapter 6. Mm -hmm. So should I be listening to this or should I wait? <laughs> no problem. You can listen. That's that's totally fine. You, okay. you can, of course, continue to listen to the earlier ones, uh, which you missed. But that's also fine because, as I mentioned, I think you were not there right in the beginning. There are many little stories and conversations, right, between the characters. So these conversations also stand on their own. So that's totally fine. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm listening. All right. Thank you. Good. You can mute yourself if you want in case there's any background noise. But if there isn't any, that's fine. Okay. Hmm. So coming back to the word evergreen. Any ideas why we're using the word evergreen here? Ever young, ever free. Those of you who come from countries with big, tall, high mountains or cold climates, maybe Perry has an idea. Perry comes from Canada. He should know. <laughs> Evergreens are the trees which, um, even during winter, when other trees shed their leaves and die, so to say, they don't really die, but they are forever green, as Perry says. Yes, so they remain green even during the dark winter. This is a wonderful symbol. Uh, winter is actually a symbol of death. When we talk about winter... It's associated with death, with the darkness. And during this dark time, this tree, as some of you know, during the winter time, uh, this tradition began in Scandinavian countries, partly also in Europe, of decorating the evergreen tree. And that was a symbol of life that survives through the period of death. And so... What is that which survives even through death? That is the pure soul or pure consciousness. Sorry, soul is not the right word. Pure consciousness. And ever young. Because pure consciousness or the self was never born and will never die. It remains eternal. So we, we don't say it's old. It is eternal and it always remains free, though it appears to be um, attached to a body that is an illusion. It is, in fact, free and remains free. We only think that we are somebody, have parents, have family, have certain background, are born in a certain country, get attached to certain cultural ideas. And so we acquire all these identities. In reality, we are pure consciousness and are forever free. So I will continue reading from verse 110. The knowledge that is experienced during Nirvikalp Samadhi is pure knowledge. It is ever-present, unalloyed and free from blemish. How can it be experienced? Pure consciousness is the background on which the phenomenal world is seen. Therefore, it must manifest itself with all its purity. It remains unnoticed 
because it is not distinguished from the phenomena which are displayed by it. If you remove all these phenomena, it shines like a clear crystal. This is the shortest method of self-realization. So what is the shortest method? The shortest method is when it appears that this external world ceases to exist, then what shines forth is pure consciousness. And when can that happen? When shall the external world disappear? Shall we just close our eyes, stuff our ears with cotton wool, sit in a quiet place, and will the world disappear? It appears to sometimes when we do that because if for the very first time if you are doing deeper meditation if you have never really closed your eyes before except to sleep and if you sit in a room that is relatively dark and quiet for the very first time if somebody does that who has not done this before, may actually experience something deeper and may also be confused by this. A couple of days ago, I got a call from somebody whom I know and she told me that it happened accidentally that she got... Uh, trapped in a in the cellar she was she, the, the door locked behind her and she couldn't get out and until somebody came home and freed her from it she ended up sitting in that dark cold and quiet cellar for for 6 hours and initially she was very scared but she realized that there was nothing she could do about it and she calmed herself down somehow, tried not to panic and she sat in the dark cellar, uh, it was really quiet there uh, right down and actually began to have certain experiences for the first time in her life because she had never done anything like this and was really shocked and surprised and so when she called me, she, she wanted to know what happened to her and what this was. So yes, for those who experience something like this for the first time, when they are deprived of external distractions, it's, it's also called sensory dep deprivation. In psychology, people have done studies on this. What happens when you are deprived of sensory uh, objects? If you put in a very dark room, you may begin to see all sorts of lights and start hallucinating. If you actually sit in a room without any sound, you will start hearing sounds. And so the, what is in the mind starts coming forward because the mind is no longer externally oriented. It is suddenly and rudely pushed into its own self and all these things which are in the unconscious come forward and during that time if you are lucky something much deeper might also just shine through we can have a look at our old diagram our favorite diagram that most of you no already, but just for clarification, we can have a look at it. And we see that most of the time we are at the level of senses. Yes, here at the level of senses. Somehow my pen doesn't seem to work. Wonder why. Let's try.
try that. Hmm. Well, okay. So if you're always at the level of senses and in a dark room you find that you are stuck there, if you are able to calm yourself enough that your breath is not, you don't start hyperventilating, that your, your breath is not uh, beginning to get so fast uh, that, that you know you almost get a kind of a asthmatic attack, then there are chances that you are able to go a little bit inward here towards the active and latent unconscious mind. So you may experience something bubbling up here from the active unconscious. Images, memories, fears, of course, deep fears when you're sitting there in complete darkness, it's totally silent. And maybe even deep emotions from the latent unconscious, like, like fear, or a deep desire, a longing for life, or longing perhaps to see somebody whom you love dearly, and the fear that you would lose that person. And perhaps while going through this experience, suddenly something from here peeps through here. It's like a little glimpse, and you experience this, and you say, wow, what was that? And when that happens, it's a privilege, it's a wonderful moment. And if you have this experience uh, intense enough or long enough that you do not forget it, then you long for it, long to go back there again and again. And in that case, this, the longing for this beauty and this incredible joy for this eternal is so strong that you are no longer afraid of the deep unconscious mind that's right here in between. In between this part which you identify with, the conscious mind, and the center of consciousness. So this part that's in between, this active latent unconscious mind, is in fact very much, I would say, like hell. There's so much stuff in it which can be very frightening, very scary, that it can be only described as hell. So in order to get to this beautiful part, you have to go through this. And um, you can settle for the glimpses once in a while that may come through. But if you want to, to really have an experience of samadhi, the Rikal samadhi, which is sustainable, which will last, what do you need to do? You need to purify so that these parts here, the active and latent unconscious mind, are really not very strong anymore. They cannot disturb you anymore. And they are like the burnt up, burnt seeds or roasted seeds, a reference to the Yoga Sutras. And then you can have experiences of pure consciousness, more often, more intense, lasting longer periods of time, until eventually you are established in the center of consciousness. So that was some thoughts about that. Um, we can go back to our text, to where we left off from. And so the shortcut, as I just explained, is that you work with, with these distractions. You remove these distractions and one way is of course to organize your life in such a way that you have fewer distractions. Some people like to go for retreats, uh, withdraw from life and um, meditate um, 
on their own. And when I say retreats, I'm not talking about commercial retreats um, to exotic places, uh, a bit like holidays. When I'm talking about retreats, I mean uh, retreating really to a place uh, to withdraw, to be quiet and uh, contemplate and use the time for deeper practices. And that is also useful. And I think the best approach is, in fact, a combination of both, to organize one's life in such a way that we are not dragged out too much, we are not disturbed too much, and also to have time that to be set aside for our spiritual practice and development. So, halfway through, I wanted to say hello to Raghu, yes, hello, and we also have Minakshi and Alan, yeah, hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> hello. So. Yes, any questions? <laughs> Raghu has been waiting a long time. Nice that you could make it this time, Raghu. Yes, Nulifa, go ahead. Okay, uh, you spoke a while back about uh, consciousness, pure mm. consciousness. Yes. And uh, then you said about the soul and you corrected yourself and said, Yes. Um, pure consciousness uh, yeah. is different from soul. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. and uh, that baffles me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. I corrected myself. Uh, that's. I'll just go back to the picture. To the. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we're back to our favorite picture here, the yogic anatomy, as we call it, and let me have my pen back. So. Um, The word soul uh, in English is a little bit unclear. It's not very specific. In the yogic anatomy and in Sanskrit, and uh, we have very specific terminology. And what has happened is that over many decades, as Sanskrit texts were being translated into English, different words were used. And the word soul, which came from English, doesn't have a very clear meaning. Sometimes people use it to mean this entire part. That means it includes the center of consciousness, but it also includes the part of active and latent unconscious, both. For that, we have another word in Sanskrit. It's called Jeev Atman. And so this is the Atman, the center of consciousness, and this is the Jiva, which includes all your samskaras, the baggage that you carry with you from previous lifetimes. And you add to it by your action in your present lifetime. So for some people, in English, the word soul is a combination of both Jiva as well as Atman. And to some people, Soul simply means center of consciousness. So it's not clear when you use the word soul what you're referring to. So eventually what happened was that when the, the academics, the scholars got together, they started to somehow agree to call the center of consciousness the self because there was no other word in English for it and um, so everybody kind of settled for the word self and so the German um, Indologists as well as the British and the Americans they all agreed on the word self and the word soul sort of dropped out of usage 
here when referring to the Indian philosophy and dharma. And so um, that is why I corrected myself, since soul is not so clear and precise. It's used in lay terms colloquially when one speaks, but it's not very accurate. Yes. Yeah? And okay. center of consciousness has many other words, like we say Atman, we say Self, we say in Sankhya Purusha, we call it pure consciousness and, um, you know, different words for it. <laughs> but it's all basically the same. It's like on flight when the captain announces uh, um, to the uh, radio control on ground, he says, we have 300 souls on board. <laughs> they don't have 300 passengers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it's the entire package, you know, it's not just Atman, but it's more than uh, pure consciousness. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. And thank you for the, for the question. It's uh, helped, I guess, uh, also for others to clarify the difference. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Rabo. Uh, thanks a lot, Radhika. It's been a long time I was waiting to interact with you. Mm -hmm. and I really appreciate the amount of great work you are doing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, I have seen your book also, The Breathing Exercises, uh, something book uh, ebook yeah okay. yeah i just want to ask how what is the importance of these breathing exercises how mm -hmm. it makes when you start practicing it mm -hmm. will connect us the the immortal self yeah mm -hmm. okay so i think i have so to... how it will lead us to there okay yeah from unconscious uh, immortal self how important role these exercises plays us yeah yeah, yeah. Can you show that diagram and explain me what happens, why we yes. have to give importance to this pranayama? Yes. Um, have you got the book? Have you actually read it? Just I was waiting for to. Is there any hard copy or I need to order only Kindle? Yeah. Um, well, the hard copy will be, the print version will be out in a, a week or two, but it will not be available in all countries. It will not, I think you're from India. It will not be available in India as yet. And so uh, that I do not know very honestly when it will be available in India. It may take a little longer. But um, just to briefly uh, explain that that book is divided into two parts. The first part is breathing exercises and the second part is pranayam. And we make a distinction that breathing exercises are not pranayama. Pranayama is done mentally and breathing exercises are related to respiration to the lungs. So if we see our diagram, it is very clear here that the breathing exercises are done here in this area between the body and the conscious mind. The breathing exercises are a bridge between body and mind. So in the process of meditation, as we want to go inward towards pure consciousness and assuming that we have quietened down the senses, the body is healthy and still, you have learned to sit still for a longer time, then we also need to quieten and still the breath. And we use the breath as a bridge to co the conscious mind. And, okay. and then when the breath is quieter and the conscious mind is quiet, we can go very deep within. Because you will find if you sit longer and your breath gets very fine, the breath will keep pulling you out. The breath will keep pulling you out. Some people say, yes, the breath is the finest uh, object of concentration. It's true only to a certain extent. Because if you want to go deeper within, you see the breath is here. It's very much outside. Center of consciousness is here. It's much deeper inside. So if you want to go deeper, at some point of time, you have to leave the breath behind. Okay. Yes? So 
you actually would go to a point where you'd forget your breath. And if some external observer were to come and, and check, is he or she breathing now? <laughs> he might not be able to find your breath. If you just put a finger in before your nose right now, you will feel your breath. Okay. Yeah, if everybody puts a finger right in front of their nose right now, you can feel your breath, right? You yes, feel it yes. going in, you can feel it out, you feel the motion of the air breathing out. But now imagine that it becomes so fine if somebody comes, external observer comes and puts his finger in f before your nose, he would not be able to find your breath. He'd think, oh, this person is not breathing. And that is leading to, okay. to kumbhak. Yeah, it's leading to kumbhak. And when that happens spontaneously, we say actually pranayam begins there. But remember, please, that this is not the kumbhak that most people are talking about, which is violently holding the breath. Violently holding the breath will damage the fine tissues of the lungs. This form of kumbhak, which is taught in modern yoga studios, is extremely dangerous because it can damage the finer tissues of the lungs and if one understands a little bit about pranic vehicles, it can also damage very fine pranic vehicles. So that's not what is meant by kumbhak. Kumbhak means spontaneous withdrawal of the breath. And then the mind goes into deep meditation. So as long as you... You, the, the deeper you go in meditation, you will find that the breath itself is disturbing. And so that's the connection between the breath, pranayam, and pranayam takes you, real pranayam is here at the level of prana. This is adi prana. This is where you're talking about. Adi prana is the first unit of prana. Right. Okay. Yes. So the breath will only help me to come to this unconscious mind. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean to say, is it? It will help you calm down and come to the conscious mind. Yes. Okay. After that, uh, to build a bridge from here to the center of consciousness, I need to adapt other techniques or? Yes, ideally then you would need to have a mantra. Yes. Mantra is the only thing then which is in the mind. If your mantra is connected to the breath, which some people do, uh, that will also keep you at the level of the breath. So you need a, a mantra form, which I always say from an authentic tradition and an authentic teacher and not from somebody, uh, not from a website or from a book. <laughs> and uh, that will lead one within because mantra vidya is a science of its own. It's a very, very esoteric, very fine, very subtle science. And actually, we say uh, that that is why you will not find really much in terms of books and all or websites explaining you really the science of mantra because it is an experiential science. You will find books where it will give you lots of mantras. There are thousands, there are even millions of mantras. But none of these are going to help you because the preparation has not been done. And so a good teacher would prepare first the ground. A mantra is like a seed. That's why you also call, they also call bija, bija mantra. It's like a seed. So if you see the farmer, the farmer doesn't scatter his seeds anywhere and anyhow, right? First, the farmer will prepare the field. Only when the field is prepared will he plant the seeds. And so, if one starts taking mantras from books and websites and stuff without proper preparation, the result is like just scattering the seeds. And it's going to be blown away by the wind. It's going to be eaten by the birds. All your seeds are going to be gone. So, practicing mantras from books, websites, etc. without proper preparation is actually a waste of time and energy. 
So Radhika ji, are you saying that practicing mantra without breathing exercises mm -hmm. is uh, kind of worthless? Um, no, that's not quite what I said. It, what I said is you need preparation and breathing exercises are just one part. Pranayam is part. deeper than breathing exercises. Ah. So you would need to prepare the body as well. You need to well, prepare yes. the, the breathing exercises, food, uh, nutrition. All this is part of the preparation. Right. Lifestyle, all that is a part of the preparation. I have on the channel um, a section called Adhikara, which talks really about how to have Adhikara. Adhikara is qualification. So how to get qualified, basically, uh, you need the preparation, the foundation. And that is some of the things mentioned there is how to organize one's life, a healthy diet, and all these things are, are mentioned in that particular. Uh, Radhika ji, yes. uh, how to clarify this uh, unconscious mind? Yeah. <laughs> yes, as I said, for that one needs a mantra and uh, before one can have a mantra, one has to have systematic preparation and uh, go through the, the process in a systematic manner. Normally we say, therefore, you need to do certain exercises, as well, um, asanas, breathing, uh, energy exercises or pranayama, you need to learn how to do these in a systematic manner and integrate these in your life. And uh, purifying the unconscious mind... Systematic way, all those things. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, do you offer any course where we learn these things in a systematic way? Um, 